Hi, I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. Is the United Nations still the go-to place for the world to solve its problems? Let's get to the bottom line. The biggest intergovernmental organization in the world just turned 75 years old this year. It was created by the big powers to prevent another world war, and in that mission, it's generally succeeded. But how's it doing on the other missions, like securing peace and delivering health and humanitarian relief? With regional wars raging, with refugees and migration at an all-time high, and a global pandemic on top? What a mess. My guest today is Mark Lowcock, the point man for humanitarian relief at the United Nations. In UN Speak, he is the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and head of the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, Emergency Relief Coordinator, and the coordinator of its COVID-19 Global Humanitarian Response Plan. Mark, those are a lot of titles. I'm so glad to have you here today. Let me just ask you, you know, what does your dashboard look like at the moment when you're looking at the parts of the world that perhaps are, are, are not front page news, but they're suffering from all sorts of maladies. Uh, and as I said, there's COVID-19 hitting them just as it's hitting us. What does your dashboard look like? Well, worse than it has for 25 years, really. The COVID crisis is obviously globally the biggest crisis the world's had for 50 years. And although the virus took longer to get to these very fragile, conflict-affected countries than it took to get to some other places, they are the most fragile, the most vulnerable, and it's hitting them harder than it's hitting even anyone else. Not so much because of the direct effect of the virus and then COVID-19, the disease on their populations, but because of the consequences of COVID, the huge economic contraction, the effect of lockdown measures they put in place, the effect of um, deteriorating health services. So we're looking at a really a bleak uh, landscape. At the beginning of this year, I thought we would need to get humanitarian assistance to 140 million people across the planet, one person in 50. Now, though, it's 250 million. That's the biggest increase we've ever seen in the year, in a year, and it's entirely down to COVID. 250 million people. I just want to underscore that number. That's your target for relief right now. Do you see the big global stakeholders lining up to give you the support you need? One of the features of this crisis is that um, we've seen very good collaboration among scientists, much more than usual. We've seen good collaboration among uh, pharmaceutical companies. I think the professional media has done a good job in getting basic factual information to people. But one of the groups that have not collaborated as well as they have in the past is countries, nation states. And um, it is a bit of a jarring disconnect that while the rich world has thrown everything, the kitchen sink, everything basically um, at the problem of protecting their own people and their own economy, pumping more than $10 trillion in fiscal support and liquidity into the system. They've not done the same in the way that they have done at some points in the past, for example, in 2008-9 in the financial crisis for the very poorest countries. Those countries have had about 2% of their national income uh, made available to them. And of course, they don't have the domestic resources that the rich countries have. So um, it is surprising to me that, not just out of generosity, but out of self-interest, really, there hasn't been a stronger response from the better off parts of the world to the weaker parts of the world during this crisis so far. We can turn that around, but we need to be quick if we, if we don't want to see huge damage. Now, Mark, I know you've been out um, for a campaign uh, of sorts for about $10 billion to help mitigate uh, some of the impact of COVID-19 on various um, economies, particularly uh, in Africa and that only 25% of that has, has been met. And I don't mean to be silly about it or, or trite, but $10 billion in the scheme of what some governments are talking about and responding to this, you know, almost is trivial. What's going on there? Well, you're right. I mean, what is needed to protect the bottom, most vulnerable 10% of the global population probably is about 90 billion. Um, for those 700 million people. Two thirds of that can come off resources essentially already available on the balance sheets of the 
International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, but the shareholders of those institutions do need to give them the instructions or authority to use those resources in that way. And then you probably need um, another 30 billion or so in what should be a modest uptick in foreign assistance. And from for our part of it, as you say, just the UN's uh, slice of that immediately in humanitarian assistance, we were looking for another $10 billion. Now, there is a paradox because we have seen increasing fundraising for humanitarian action in recent years. Last year, we raised a record $18 billion, and that allowed us to reach more than 100 million people and certainly saved millions of lives. Um, but this year, because of COVID, we started the year thinking we'd need 30 billion, but in fact need 40 billion. And we might get to 20, because I think we will have another fundraising record year. But it, the gap between what we actually need and what we're able to raise, I'm afraid will be bigger than ever. And that will mean that, that some of these problems probably will get out of control. We'll see some things we thought we'd abandoned, got rid of across the world, like the return of famine like huge increases in child mortality, like reducing life expectancy. And some of those things, if we let them get out of control, will come back to bite the richer countries. So my argument to those richer countries is that it's not just about being generous, it's about protecting yourself from future problems as well. You, you tweeted out the other day something I found very compelling, but would love to know more about, which is, that we're about to see many of the gains on gender equality and gender advancement uh, around the world, women's rights be rolled back uh, in this time because of the impact of COVID. What's the connection? You know, the last 50 years, but especially the last 25 years have seen what's probably the most remarkable story in human history. 50 years ago, most people on the planet, more than 50%, were living in the most dire extreme poverty kids dying in childbirth, people hungry all the time, people not going to school. And over the last 50 years, that number has been reduced from more than 50% to a bit less than 10%. It's really an incredible story. But what COVID has done in the last 25 weeks is, is put at risk 25 years of progress. And, um, you know, we can still limit the damage, but all the things you talk about, um, blighting the lives of women and girls in particular, you know, um, 500 million kids out of school, at least half of them girls in the countries with humanitarian problems. Many of those girls out of school now will never go back. As we have in some better off countries, we've seen a huge increase in gender-based violence, attacks mostly in their own home against women. That's a consequence of the stresses that people feel in the home when there's no income because people have lost their jobs or can't go out to work. So all these things are put at risk and they're, you know, they're put at risk a little more than they, they need to be because the response hasn't been uh, how it has been in the past when we've had crises. You know, uh about 30 years ago, believe it or not, three decades ago, when I was affiliated with the RAND Corporation, RAND put out a study at that time, and, and in it, it said there's no major policy issue facing the United States at that moment that didn't have a major international component, whether you looked at drug issues or you looked at then what was concerned about environmental issues and, 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 and maybe reframed differently from climate, um, or you looked at uh, narco gangs, you looked at, you know, the whole whole wide variety of challenges facing the country um, were international. And we seem to be at a time, as I said a few moments ago, where nations are in kind of a, uh, you know, it's all about me mode. I'm just interested with your experience in international affairs, how you turn that around. How do you go out and get empathy built back so that you understand that Sudan matters or Yemen matters? Well, I think we do have to start with the facts. And what Rand discovered 30 years ago is 100 times as true now. The world has never been more interconnected. Look at the tiny amount of time it took for this virus to travel around the whole planet. A problem that starts anywhere can get everywhere instantaneously in the modern world. And in a, a way that wasn't true 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when Rand did that study, everybody everywhere can see what's going on everywhere else all the time. 
And so people in better off countries really have no excuse not to know what's going on, but they all also ought to be aware that people in the poorest countries can see what's going on in the better off parts of the world. And they don't understand when they have such huge problems, they can't get a bit more help with them. And that creates its own sets of risks and grievances. You know, you have recently called out Saudi Arabia um, specifically and said it needs to do more um, as, it, as it's promised to do in Yemen. It had a war over the last six years. Yemen is deteriorating. I'd love to kind of see where you are with that. But, but whether or not there are other nations that need to be called out for not carrying their share of the burden right now in responding to these global crises. And I would ask you about, you know, the country I'm in now, the United States. Are we doing what we should be doing? Well, I think the world always responds best to crises when there's a strong lead from the United States. Um, and I've written and spoken about that before. I think um, we saw that in the 2008-9 financial crisis when uh, the US government were able to corral everybody in the G20 to um, get all the countries together and get the World Bank and IMF to put all their financial firepower basically at the disposal of poorer countries. We saw it in dealing with the HIV AIDS pandemic in the 1980s. We saw it in dealing with Ebola in 2014-15. So the world always does best when there is US leadership, but the burden does need to be shared in a fair way. And I think um, it's important to recognize that it's still the case. The US is the biggest financier of humanitarian action, the biggest funder of, for example, UNICEF, and the UN Refugee Agency and our World Food Programme, and other countries need to step up too. When it comes to Yemen, um, I think the key point to note is that we have prevented a total tragedy with the loss of life running into the millions in Yemen in recent years, um, because despite the total destruction of the economy um, and the impact of the war, um, we have been able to mount a huge, the world's largest humanitarian operation, reaching 15 million people or more every month. Now, we're not doing that in 2020. And the only reason we're not doing that is because countries who gave us money generously in 2018 and 2019 are not doing it to the same extent now. And last year, Saudi Arabia was our biggest donor. And I repeatedly said everywhere I could that I thought that was a very good thing. And I was grateful to them. Of course, they have long-term interests in Yemen, it's their neighbor. Geography is permanent and they have to worry about um, the problems that are gonna brew there for not just the next few years, but for the next century. But I think there is a particular responsibility for a country like Saudi Arabia to keep financing these life-saving humanitarian um, programs in Yemen um, because of the geography and because um, of their role in the wider uh, situation in the country. You know, I can't imagine what the work environment is that you have to navigate. You know, there was a resolu resolution just passed by the UN General Assembly uh, uh, two weeks ago, passed by them, that, that, that the United States and Israel voted against. And the, uh, the, the, you know, when asked, the United States, you know, had five problems with it. It was, you know, China, uh, and, and a spat with China, the World Health Organization, you know, uh, the, America is very frustrated with the WHO, abortion policies, uh, climate policies, and, and, this, um, uh, uh, and some language in the resolution about sanctions. And so I guess when, you know, I, I, you know and maybe uh, it goes back to that old John Bolton quote that the UN works when the United States wants it work to work and it doesn't work when it, when it doesn't. But I'm just interested in this in this environment where you're trying to do global good and achieve global justice and create a different commons. How bad are the spats between the big stakeholders right now over the, these global justice um, and really pandemic issues and global health issues? Well, of course, the history of the United Nations and we're celebrating our 75th birthday this year, as you alluded to, but the history of the UN um, has seen lots of periods when nation states have struggled to get on with each other. That was the case, obviously, throughout the whole of the Cold War. Um, and one of the one of the things the United States, the United Nations, is is a stage on which the nations can at least talk, uh, can see what they can agree on, and can at least have a dialogue on the things they struggle to agree on. The UN, though, is also an actor. 
And one of my main responsibilities is thousands of miles away from um, here in New York, where I'm talking to you from um, now, where a lot of the dialogue between governments takes place, out there in the countries where there are humanitarian problems. And every year, the UN, through the programs I coordinate, delivering food and water and education and healthcare and shelter to people caught up in these crises, we reach more than 100 million people. And I'm grateful to the donors who voluntarily give us the money to do that, because that, that saves millions of lives every year. One of the cheapest ways of saving a life, in fact, is to invest in our um, programs. And those things go on and are keeping going on, even in the midst of the difficulties nation states are obviously having at the moment in finding resolution uh, to some of the world's big problems. Now, Mark, there are a lot of criticism out there that, that the UN doesn't operate as well as it should, uh, that it lacks efficiency, that there's nepotism. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put, you're not the Secretary General to carry that burden, but, you know, I suppose with someone with such a distinguished career working both in the UK government, now in, you know, the world's most important international body, are, are, there, are there things that the United Nations can and should do uh, to improve its performance? Well, I came into this job um, at, at Antonio Guterres's request, um, you know, three and a half years ago, he, he appointed me because I thought not just that the UN does a lot of important things and does them well, but also crucially, there's a, there's a whole lot of things we need to do better. And um, the Secretary General was elected on the basis of a reform agenda. Um, we're making good progress on that, I think. My own responsibilities are to try to make the humanitarian agencies as efficient and effective as possible um, to deal with problems that we've had in our sector, like lots of other sectors um, have had in recent times, like um, dealing with sexual exploitation and abuse. Every large institution has uh, found it has not dealt well with looking after women in its institution, look at all the media organizations across the private sector, look at experience in the church, um, of multiple denominations. So we've got our share of problems in the UN, but we are determined to make ourselves better, to be honest when we find problems, but mostly to be committed to find solutions to those problems. Because one of the fundamental truths about the work we do in the humanitarian sector is we might raise record amounts of money year on year, but it's never enough. And we have to make sure every dollar works as hard as it can to get to the right people. Uh, so we maximize the suffering reduced and the number of lives saved. And that's the motivating factor for us in doing the best job possible. Uh, I recently uh, saw Secretary Gutierrez, not, you know, before the pandemic, I think, you know, I, I told him how, how much respect I had for you and your work, um, but he's expressed a lot of frustration uh, in the way the world has responded to the pandemic. And I have a sound clip from him uh, that I'd like you to hear. When I listen to the voices of the youth, when I listen to the voices of the civil society, I see there the seeds that hopefully will fructify in a much better coordination in the future of our response to pandemics like this one. So uh, I am frustrated, of course, uh, with the lack of international cooperation at the present moment, but I'm hopeful that the new generations will be able to make things change in the future. So I'm not asking this facetiously. I think he's making a very interesting observation and point. And the point really is, do we need to kind of get beyond this narcissistic, self-absorbed generation of leaders and get to a new generation, hold things together until we get to a net new generation where you see people like Greta Thunberg out there on climate. You know, in the United States, we see you know, the parkland uh, uh, kids out on, you know, guns and we see, you know, some sanity coming from a younger generation of people that want something different. I'd love to get your, you know, take on whether the empathy that we need about people who uh, not only need, but really require relief. And as you said, their security is also our security, whether that's going to become a generational uh, opportunity. Uh, we'll just put it that way rather than saying a generational crisis. Well, I must say, I mean, I have um, kids myself and they're between the ages of 20 and 24. And I think this is a generation which is much more engaged and knowledgeable and thoughtful about the world they're going to inherit and perhaps a little bit more critical um, of the 
generation that came before them than some other generations. And I have to say, I think that's a really good thing. When I engage with um, young people during the course of my work, for example, talking to the model United Nations, where we bring young people from all around the world to um, debate and um, play the roles of um, the ambassador from their country in the UN or the leaders in the UN, I see a lot of knowledge and skill and passion and commitment and determination. But the thing that they have worked out is the world they are going to inherit is a very interconnected world. So it's not just um, a matter of empathy that makes them want to engage with others. They've worked out it's a matter of urgent self-interest because all the problems they're inheriting travel across borders and they have they've worked out that their future depends on the future of people in other parts of the world and i think that is going to be a growing determinant of um you know how international public policy is going to have to be um, dealt with in the period ahead notwithstanding the fact that we're obviously at the moment in a difficult period of um, dialogue and inadequate collaboration between member states. We need to get out of that funk, get back into um, cooperation, collaboration in everybody's interest, and young people can inspire us uh, to do that and will demand we do that, I think. You know, Mark, I want to ask you something complicated and, and ask you to take your UN hat off and maybe put your former British government hat and just to ask you a question of how you achieved the success you did, because you used to direct international, international aid programs for the UK. And as I understand it, you got spending. I mean, spending is not everything, you know, but it's but you got to have people supporting it. You have to have people believing it, that you got it up to about 0.7 percent. Most many people think we spend 70 percent, you know, on foreign aid, but it's really trivially small, but that 0.7% is a high bar and only a few countries hit it. The United States is a paltry, paltry, sort of a fifth of that uh, level. And I'm, I'm just wondering what you do as a government to, I, I, you know, incentivize, to bring together, you know, the understanding and support that it takes to both make those tax dollars available, but also to believe in the efficacy and importance of international programs. Well, I think the starting point is that there were five British prime ministers in succession over a 25 year period, all of whom decided that the UK playing a strong role on in international development was something that was important, it, it, both for moral reasons and politicians, I think, generally come into public life in order to make a difference. And this is an area where British politicians have wanted to make a difference. Um, but also because the UK is a, an island um, and is very affected by what happens um, as a small, relatively small country everywhere else in the world. So that was a starting point. The second thing that was very important, though, is to be able to demonstrate if you were using more taxpayers' dollars, you were spending the money well. And the fact that aid resources were contributing to saving more kids' lives, fewer kids dying in childhood, getting more kids going to school, increasing life expectancy, reducing hunger, but also promoting um, democracy and stability and better governance, which is one of the things we saw, particularly in the 1990s and the first decade in this um, century around the world. People could see positive progress being made and the money being spent well, even right. though they could also see all the pressures on the, um, the, the domestic fiscus. And of course, as you said, the UK did get to the point where it was spending 0.7% of its national income on promoting these goals overseas, but it was still spending 99.3% right. um, of its national income on things at home. So people thought that was a reasonable balance. Well, Mark Lowcock, uh, United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and uh, Emergency Relief Coordinator, thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us where the UN is going and how uh, you're responding to the COVID-19 crisis. Thank you so much. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? If you hold up a mirror to our world like the United Nations does, you'll find fewer and fewer people who are interested in cooperating with their neighbors. There's less empathy out there. There's less concern for people who are on the same global boat. And there are more and more communities adopting a me first attitude toward just about everything. It's hard to find people anywhere who are appealing to the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln once said. Of course, there are some who are working hard on global justice and relief, and I don't want to forget them. They are so important, but they just don't have the tilt in these times. 
And anyway, we don't have much of a choice. The United Nations is complicated, it's messy, and it's flawed, but vital in these dark days and dark times. And that's the bottom line.